Good evening. My name is Allison Kaplan. I'm Director of Education at the National First Ladies Library, located at the National First Ladies Historic Site in Canton, Ohio. Um, just some housekeeping things. I wanted to make sure as we're getting started, you should be able to see a PowerPoint on the screen um, and you should be able to hear me. So I just wanna confirm that you can see everything okay. And I'm gonna test it out. No PowerPoint. <laughs> so let's make sure. No PowerPoint. <laughs> Okay, so as we're troubleshooting here and trying to figure that out, I want to mention a few upcoming programs. Um, we have a film program at the National First Ladies uh, Library um, coming up soon. Um, uh, on April 12th, uh, Hyde Park in the Hudson. Um, it's a film uh, featuring Eleanor Roosevelt as a character. So we're really excited about that. If you've joined us for our film discussion in the past, you know um, that you can um, log on um, to discuss the film, find the film either through your local library or online. Um, coming up on April 25th, we have our Cooking with the First Ladies program. Um, we'll be covering Betty Ford this time around. Um, and then our book club, I'm really excited about May 23rd, we're going to be reading Karen Tumulty's, um Nancy Reagan biography. Um, and again, Give me one second and we will fix up the PowerPoint as we go to get started. Sorry about that. The presenter and I can see it. So we're just going to troubleshoot it really quickly. Um, and let's see. Uh, April 18th, our Fun with Flotus program we have uh, coming up. It's a uh, related to Easter and it is uh, Nancy Reagan and um, an Easter celebration, a totally 80s Easter celebration. That is a children's program. And then we're super excited to bring back our legacy lecture on May 4th. We'll have Anne Han, the jewelry designer with us for a special Q and A. So I'm gonna, um, have it looks like Laura's saying the screen sharing is paused. So we're going to come back on and have Laura test it really quick and I'll introduce her um, as we're doing that, if that's okay with everyone. Apologies, we are um, dealing with a few technical issues. Um, we're working from instead of PowerPoint today, I think Google Slides, which is new to me. And we'll see if we can unpause the screen sharing. So I'm going to have Laura come back on the screen. Here she is. And we'll start to another screen share and see how it works. It says it's we've muted our screen sharing. Thanks for all the technical um, guidance to everyone in the audience. I totally appreciate it. Sometimes it just has a little bit of a blip. So let's see, Laura. Did you say it wasn't, it was, uh, let's see. I can also share from my end and just run the slides if that works well for you. Do you want me to go back out and come back in? Um, I'm gonna stop the screen share. Let's okay. see, let's do it this way. I'm gonna screen share. We'll see how this works. Can you see my screen? So we'll want to take it back up to the beginning. If, if yeah. We can do that. Great. So we'll do it this way, and I'll take it back to the beginning, and I will be the slide controller. 
I'm so sorry about that, everyone. We've had some technical issues. We've actually practiced this a few times. I think it's just something a little bit new. So let me make sure I can run it. That works. So thank you, everyone. You didn't expect this to be the participatory program that it is. But at the National First Ladies Library, we're all about education and learning, whether it's learning about the First Ladies or floral design or learning about technology. So uh, for housekeeping, if you do have other AV issues or you need to point them out to us, we totally appreciate that. Let us know. Or if you have questions for tonight's speaker as we're going, please put them in the chat, put them in the Q&A. We will address them throughout the program, um, at the close of the program, actually. So I am so excited to have Laura Dolling here. Um, when I tracked Laura down um, this past year, um, I was super excited. I wanna tell you a little bit about her before I turn things over to her. So Laura Dowling served as chief floral designer at the White House from 2009 until 2015. As creative director for flowers and decor, she managed the White House floral design for thousands of official private events, including state dinners, parties, receptions, and large-scale installations such as July 4th, Halloween, and the iconic White House Christmas. Her lush and lively floral creations also grace the, grace the White House state rooms, East and West Wing offices, Camp David, and the Presidential Private Re Residence. As Chief Floral Designer, Laura launched innovative strategic partnerships with the nation's top artists and designers, White House policy staff, and the Office of Science and Technology, and Presidential Innovation Fellows, creating imaginative, cutting-edge decor and flowers. She's the author of several books, including Floral Diplomacy at the White House, A White House Christmas, and Wreaths. Uh, Laura's latest book is called Bouquets, and it was released in January 2020, and it features 75 how-to designs. So how did Laura come into this work? In 2000, she was inspired to change careers after a trip to Paris, during which she became intrigued with fl French floral design and history. She studied French floral art in Paris and extended her floristry training in Germany. At home near DC, Laura established her own floral design business and studio in a basement kitchen. After a widely publicized competition commenced at the start of the Obama administration, she entered the search for a new White House chief floral designer. Following a months long nationwide competition, she was selected for this prestigious position in 2009. A native of Chellis, Washington, Laura received an Associates of Arts degree from Centralia College, a Bachelor's of Arts degree in Political Science, and a Master's degree in Public Administration from the University of Washington in Seattle. Prior to her White House assignment, Dowling was senior management manager of strategic communication at the Nature Conservancy. She's an annual presenter and judge at the Philadelphia Flower Show, the nation's oldest and largest flower expo, as well as a regular speaker at national, regional, and local horticultural associations, garden clubs, and museums. She's been featured in design magazines and on HGTV. Um, and she has many other endeavors from being a TEDx speaker to um, being commissioned to create a collection of forever stamps. So I am so excited to turn things over to Laura. And again, if you have questions for Laura, they'll be addressed at the end of the talk. Just put them in the chat or the Q&A and I will um, mute myself and hide myself. And uh, Laura, just let me know when you wanna change slides. Much. Well, thank you, Allison, and thank you all for joining me. Um, Allison, nice job with the technical uh, fixes. Um, I, I don't know about you all, but I always find that these are tricky no matter how many times you do it. But um, I'm delighted to be here, and on this spring day, um, it's really peak season, cherry blossom season in D.C., so I have kind of a pink theme going on around me um, in my kitchen studio with lots of pink flowers and the daffodils. So I hope it's very beautiful where, where you all are, are at. So today um, I wanted to talk about floral diplomacy and 
what that is, is really the art and practice of communicating with flowers. We all do that, I think, inherently and intrinsically on a, on a personal level. When you give flowers to someone for Mother's Day or for a birthday, for Valentine's Day, it really conveys sentiment and emotion and often personal themes. So at the White House level, it's really just taking it up a notch. And then the themes become environmental or policy or policy related, or, with, or they send di uh, diplomatic messages um, or even cultural references. So um, for example, each first lady has her own style, own vision, on how flowers and decor represent that administration. So the next slide shows um, how floral design and um, the art of the table actually began. And when we think of first ladies, they're the ones who typically decide the decor, the themes for White House events. But um, George Washington actually was noted um, in the beginning for creating these incredible table tableaus that uh, represented what he felt were our American ideals. So he didn't want anything to be too regal, too much um, looking like the monarchy. So his idea was that it should be understated elegance. And you can see this table setting at Mount Vernon with the French porcelain, the elegant um, tableau that's that mirrored piece in the in the center of the table um, I, I feel like George Washington really set the tone for style and um, entertaining the next slide shows how Franklin Pierce who was the 14th president um, of the United States um, he is really credited as the one who took flowers at the White House and took them to each of the, the various rooms. The reason he did that, because he and his wife suffered a, a grave personal tragedy. Their 10-year-old son died. Um, I think it was a train accident. And his wife, Jane Pierce, in the next slide, um, you can see how she was in mourning. She wouldn't come from her room. And what the president did was put the flowers all around um, the White House and in the various rooms to try and draw her out and make her feel better. And by all accounts that that worked, but um, I, I think you can see how sad she is. The next slide, um, Allison, if we can, shows Mary Todd Lincoln, one of my favorite um, first ladies, her style with the flowers, um, embellishment in the hair, around the dress, even the base of the dress. Apparently, she was uh, quite a style maven and said fashion, made fashion statements. Um, she was on the cutting edge of decor. If you have a chance to look at the Lincoln China, it's really interesting. The color of it is called sulfurino purple. It's a fuchsia combination, fuchsia and purple. Um, cream middle with this border and then a, a gold um, rim around it. But at the time it was very fashion forward, cutting edge. It's still one of my favorite um, in, the, in the White House collection, one of my favorite pieces. But Mary Todd Lincoln um, always exceeded her budget, um, but she was a big fan of decor apparently. Um, the other image at the top shows the Monroe Plateau, one of the most priceless pieces in the White House collection during the Grant administration. First Lady Julia Grant did not particularly care for the Monroe Plateau, apparently. I'm not sure why, but she had the in-house staff create these um, copper ribbon embellishments to fly out over the top of this. So when you look at this table setting, look how high it goes. I mean, it's really gilding the lily. Um, even after all that, she still didn't really care for this um, design or the, this piece and apparently had it banished to the offsite warehouse where it was stored for many years, but eventually made its way back. I mean, today it's used for special occasions, um, twice when, when I was there, when there were official visits from the president of France, but it really is an incredible piece. The lower image shows the blue room as it's set up for a White House wedding. Grover Cleveland was the only, um, is the only president to have ever been married at the White House. 
and you can look at the ferns and look at the stylish topiaries and, and things that are used in the Blue Room. The next slide shows this couple, Grover Cleveland, who was 47 at the time, his young bride, Frances Folsom, only 21, which caused a, a bit of a scandal. Um, but kind of an exciting thing to have a, a White House wedding. The next slide is Mamie Eisenhower. When we talk about White House flowers, you have to mention Mamie Eisenhower and her quintessential favorite color of pink. I did a little research and found out that pink was her favorite color. She felt that it looked good on her, that it complimented her eyes, but it was also a color that she used in her household decor. When she was traveling as a military wife, she would go abroad or different places and always have an element of pink, her color scheme, pink and green um, with uh, creamy, like a cream colored accent. So uh, one of the stories I really like about the White House is how the president would bring in um, on a tray her breakfast each morning with a little um, single pink carnation. So that was one of her favorite flowers. The next slide is Jackie Kennedy, another um, incredible style icon and really the founder, I think, of White House decorating style. She created the Office of the Chief Florist, um, which is where I worked, the Office of the Curator. I think many of you might have seen her, her tour that she gave of the renovations and redecoration of the White House. If we look at the next slide, you can see her style, which is really a timeless look of garden style. The flowers are open and they look almost as if she could have gone out to the White House garden and selected the flowers and put them in the various vases. Um, she favored really this European style, Dutch masters, French, um, French influence. And the first White House florist was actually from the Park Service. So she taught him her, her favorite style of design, which I, I think is so interesting. And then the next slide shows how Lady Bird Johnson continued her theme and really put her own stamp on style. She had her wildflower initiative. You'll see the, the China from, from the Johnson era. Another one of my favorites because of all the, the flowers that have meaning um, there around representing the 50 states. And then the eagle motif is, um, of course, the presidential seal. So when I first came to the White House, I was intrigued. There was a big cabinet behind my desk that housed one example, one plate of each of the White House china sets. And so when I pulled out this plate, I thought this is incredible and would be perfect for a ladies luncheon. So I had the linens, the flowers, all in shades of pink and peach. And at the time, the, um, the social secretary, I think, said, well, you know, the, that's not available. Apparently, the, the China had been banished to the warehouse because someone thought that it was um, an old fashioned design. You know, it looked like grandmother's China. But we talked about it when we looked at how it all came together and how the flowers had this other layer of meaning for all the states, they decided that, well, yes, that, that could work, that did work. And they brought the China back, all 220 place settings, um, which I think the curators grumbled a little bit about. Um, but it was fun to use. We used it very many times while, while I was there. The next slide shows Nancy Reagan and uh, another iconic first lady with a style featuring the signature red. Her favorite room was the red room. Um, there's a portrait in the east entrance in her red column dress. And then the Reagan china, which again was um, very timeless in, in its design with this almost orange red blend. It was perfect at Christmas time. We used it for the China, china State dinner um, when red was a major theme, but you can see how the color is um, her signature color, really, Nancy Reagan red. Um, the next slide. Um, Rosalind Carter, a, a different approach where Nancy Reagan, I think, favored the really high style, glamorous look in flowers and fashion. Rosalind Carter liked a, a more homespun garden style effect. 
So she often used branches <clears throat> and materials from her native Georgia, camellia, things in bloom, very seasonal displays. Here she's actually arranging flowers with Joan Mondale, the senator's wife, and seems to be really enjoying it. And the next slide is Laura Bush um, and a different style. So I would call her sensibility very classic, very elegant, but with a modern touch. And by modern, I mean with the color choices, um, bold, monochromatic, bold colors like this. And if you look at the china, this um, <clears throat> beautiful green trellis pattern, it's actually based on a historic motif from the Madison china. So I use this china so often, um, <clears throat> would recommend it for, for different events. It was really just so versatile um, and beautiful. And, and that was really, when I think of her design style, that, that's what it looks like. And you'll see the next slide shows an, a, a Bush State dinner where um, this charming display <clears throat> for India, topiaries that look like elephants. And I can only imagine that these were quite conversation pieces. The next slide, please. And during my tenure, we were <clears throat> lucky to have two France state dinners, and the, the iris is the national flower of France, and here it is represented with this um, watercolor um, table linen, and all the tables alternated with, with different but complementary designs. The next slide shows the president and the first lady with the president of France, and you'll notice that he's there alone. Um, he's the bachelor, what, well, this is the previous president, Francois Hollande. He had a girlfriend and a mistress, and I guess couldn't decide which uh, person to bring. So he came alone, and luckily that was not my uh, problem to worry about, just the flowers. Um, the next slide, please. And in the private residence, always before a state dinner, there's a private reception for the principal. So this is a time before all of the pomp and circumstance of the formal dinner where the principals get together, um, they have a drink there. You can see the Marine band, the, um, the quartet playing, and it's just a quiet time, a personal time. And this was an opportunity to really tell a story with the flowers. So for the France state dinner, these flowers were spring flowers in bloom, the, the Eve Piaget, the pink roses. Um, I would always give notes to the first lady on the flower selections, what they meant. Um, you can see the bamboo trellis that's there, like a, a French garden style arrangement in blooming lilac and jasmine. And this would be an opportunity then for the first lady to have a conversation and show that they're honoring um, their, their guests. And the next slide. So here's a picture of the White House um, cooler in the flower shop, a place where I spent many hours <laughs> over six years, about a hundred hour work weeks. Um, and these were flower, you can, if you look closely at the, the rack there, this is the Vermeil bamboo, the centerpiece, my favorite centerpiece um, that Jackie Kennedy selected, gold over silver, and it was just the right size, the right proportion um, to create beautiful flowers. And the next slide we'll go to. Okay, this is for Halloween. Um, I think, Allison, if you back up, there might be one that we skipped over. Yeah, um, wanna show that one because here I am after my competition um, to compete for the White House flower job. And I look at that now and let's see where I think we're going on 13 years ago. Um, I, I feel like that expression is a little bit dear in the headlights. And the reason is because um, I found out I won the competition. That's my blue room piece. I'm standing in the blue room and um, it was early October. They said, Congratulations, you won. Um, now you need to start because the next slide shows the White House Halloween was coming up. And that was the year that Johnny Depp 
was in Alice in Wonderland and there were the Star Wars characters and um, we had lots of decorations to create. So these are giant oversized wreaths um, made out of vegetables. And you'll see an ongoing theme in, in my White House displays during this time that the fruits and vegetables played a role. This was um, part of this policy initiative that the First Lady had, Let's Move. So it was an homage to that showing um, in a subtle way, um, I, I think making the case about healthy eating. So the next slide shows some more Halloween um, yeah, some more Halloween decorations. The, the Obama family dogs, Bo and Sunny, they're not the real dogs here, but we created replicas, many, many replicas out of all kinds of black and white material and dressed them up. So you have Sunny the sunflower, Bo the pirate. We'll continue. And then the state dinner. So it went straight from Halloween to the first state dinner of the Obama administration, which was for India. And this was a tented affair for 400 people. So th this is like my first month on the job. Um, go to the next slide. Oh, and the day after the state dinner was the White House Christmas installation. So I kind of look back at that period and think, um, well, I didn't sleep probably for a year, but especially that first month was a little bit trial by fire. The next slide. And another uh, highlight, I guess I wanted to share with you during my first week, um, sit in the flower shop working and all of a sudden, who comes in with an entourage, but one of my design idols, uh, Martha Stewart, and that was fascinating. So usually we, we never did take pictures with the celebrities or the, the sports uh, athletes, all, all of the people who came by to visit either the flower shop or the, the kitchen, but for some reason, um, someone did snap this picture and, and I'm glad I have it. Um, the next slide, please. Um, and the Oval Office. So as a White House employee, a residence employee, I had a top secret clearance. And what that meant was that I had access to every room in the White House compound, including the private rev uh, residence, including the Oval Office. And we kept flowers. And you might also remember the, the, um, the bowl of apples that was in the the Oval Office during the Obama administration. So we would often go there. Um, this is certainly not an everyday occurrence. Um, there were no flower briefings, for example, um, with the president, but a special time when, um, when I was able to be there um, with my family and to have a photograph. The next slide, please. So I wanted to step back a bit and tell you um, how I came to hold the White House a floral position, um, kind of my own inspiration. And then maybe it'll be something you can think about, um, you know, and what it inspires you and how you can take a passion and, and see where it takes you. So the next slide shows Paris in all of its glory, especially in the spring, actually any time of year, but um, flower markets on every corner, everywhere you go, it seemed to me at the time, my first trip to Paris, which was about 20 years ago, um, was inspiration, whether it was architectural, um, you know, the next slide I think shows um, additional scenes um, in the hotels. The, and I, I particularly noticed the, the beautiful bouquets. They were like nothing I'd ever seen before. So this opulent style, the grand bouquet, it just made a statement, it commanded your attention, um, but also very much a garden influence. So a, a natural style of flowers, you can see on the right, the lilac, the roses, lots of roses and peonies, classical flowers, but put together in, in this really intriguing way. Let's go to the next slide. And um, the other thing I noticed was the, the couture element. So if you can imagine French fashion and how it applies to flowers, these are, are the French bouquets or what I have come to think of as the quintessential French bouquet. So on the left, you can see the combination 
and these strong color combinations um, with, with other elements like the, the feathers or the silk ribbon. And then on the right, this bouquet of muscari and French violets is actually um, sewn together. So it really almost melds fashion and flowers in this beautiful way. The next slide. Um, and also um, I think an element of the French style is this real awareness of where the flowers are placed, um, the messages that they're sending. So always the, the colors being complementary, always setting the right tone. I've actually been in flower shops where the person buying the flower will um, engage in a long conversation. I mean, sometimes going on half an hour or longer about the purpose of the flowers, where they're going, what they're designed to mean, what the colors need to be. And so there's really a, an exchange, I think, between the artist and the customer. The next slide. Here's the shop of my friend and mentor, Catherine Mueller. So I studied with her for about 15 years. She still teaches in this um, studio that's near the Louvre and I think really captures the, the beauty of, of the French style. She has a unique style and really a gift for color. Um, and by studying with her, I felt like I learned the techniques. It gave me the groundwork to then come back home and start to develop my own style. We'll go to the next one, please. And so these bouquets um, that I created in, in the French style, um, photographed in Paris, but, but really with the French flowers, um, with this composition that starts with a base of greenery, and then the flowers are made in a spiral technique. You build it in the hand, um, and always with things that um, Catherine used to say, you, you need the butterflies, you need the escaping elements that give it a whimsy, or um, on the right, you can see there, there are actual butterflies, um, faux butterflies, <laughs> with chamomile and um, I think even um, there's an unusual element of, of rice cakes um, that are built into this one. So this was a, a special bridal bouquet. The next slide. Um, so I'm in my kitchen, this is my kitchen studio. And when I came back from Paris, I wanted to to start creating. And I realized that the French technique was a little more complicated or there was a lot to learn about it. So working full time, I would take a vacation, go to Paris once or twice a year and study flowers, study with Catherine. I met some other French designers, come back to my studio. And then um, I created a little part-time business. So on the side evenings and weekends, I created bouquets for weddings and small events, small parties, if we can keep going. I used my house as an experimental backdrop. So here's the kitchen, um, you know, the kitchen table that was, was really where I built and constructed all of the bouquets, but experimenting with different colors, different combinations of china, um, and always working in, in this French concept of building a structured bouquet that has movement and liveliness. The next slide. At Christmas time, um, so I live in a period house. It was built in 1800. And um, so it really is a, a fun way for me to, um, to use this as a laboratory. And um, so getting practice with, with Christmas, which became of course important at the White House, um, but again, working with color. And, and I found that even though I had a base level or a collection of ornaments, that each year I could change up the design with ribbons or it wouldn't be too hard to create a whole new theme um, with additional materials and especially with some natural elements. So the next uh, slide please, I think shows a, another version um, of a green theme. So. Um, down in the dining room, um, this was a table setting with, with green ornaments, green ribbons. I'm always on the lookout for things that I can add to the collection that can then become, become its own theme. So I think there's a lot of power in a monochromatic display. 
um, but I do like all kinds of colors mixed together. Um, but this this china too, I, I think, um, helped determine the, the theme that year. Um, I think we have a pink theme coming up that goes with the theme today. If you can go to the next slide. Um, yeah, so the wreath is made out of potatoes. And no matter where you live, if you're in a hot or cold climate, the, the potatoes um, are really a fantastic element to use and create with because they're long lasting and they have good colors. So um, the wreath on the door and then that's Nandina foliage that, that picks up that, that color tint. So this was the year of the pink, um, the pink and gold tree. Um, so, you know, I, I kind of work with a theme um, I start with the entryway and then carry it out throughout the house. Um, the next slide shows a fruit and flower theme. Um, and with topiaries, with garlands, with, with wreaths, these are all the elements that um, involve learning and practicing some basic techniques, but things that I could really take with me to the White House. Next slide. So one of the big projects I did right before I went to the White House was this huge table display. So if you can imagine, this was a 16 foot round table and in the center is a five foot uh, gig ginormous, gigantic um, centerpiece. I actually used a, a child's wading pool as the, the vase covered it in moss. It was filled with foam at the time that made it way um, right away about 400 pounds, it, it seemed like. So um, there are logistics involved um, with creating something like that. And then I realized that aesthetically it needed a much bigger um, footprint on the table. So I created these seven smaller bouquets. And when these were delivered to the, the Chinese embassy, my, my handler um, got very quiet and he said, did you know that, um, that your arrangement is very auspicious? That the seven, did you know that the seven bouquets surrounding are like the seven Chinese moons surrounding the Chinese sun? And um, I said, well, of course I knew that when I didn't know that, that was luck. But, but what it taught me was that there's so much that goes in to creating official bouquets. I had a list of do's and don'ts the, the color schemes, the types of flowers, and they all had symbolic meaning for um, the Chinese. Um, and it was important to get it right. So this was right before I went to the White House. And I think the next slide shows the start of the White House competition. If we can back up, Allison, there's one more slide. So the way that that started, the way it worked was in 2009, the, the chief florist at the White House retired and it created an opening that hadn't been in effect, I think for about 30 years. My husband said that I should apply for the job. So you've seen my kitchen and that's where I was working. I was doing parties, events, small weddings. I did do the Chinese embassy, but I was working out of my kitchen as a part-time florist. So I really didn't think that um, I had any chance or really any business of applying for that job. Um, if we go to the next slide. But my husband was persistent and um, he actually called up the White House, found the, the number, the name of the person to contact. And I was sitting, and so I did submit a resume. I did submit, an, um, yeah, it was a resume and a cover letter. And while I was sitting in a flower class in Germany, this is a, a class with Gregor Lersch. I got an email from the White House that said, congratulations, you're one of 17 semifinalists. And that just amazed me. I couldn't believe it. We go to the next slide. It launched this months long process of rounds of competition of interviews. And the first in-person interview I had was in the map room with a panel of White House officials. And I remember no one was smiling. It was very intense. Um, a little, you know, I, it was rather intimidating. And the questions weren't really so much about flowers, but about management, about budgets, uh, about staffing, all of that. Um, and then if we go to the next slide. 
this is the picture of the blue room piece that that I created. Um, there was a competition um, that Allison told you about that I've referenced, and the competition was three people, three finalists, all brought back to the White House, put in separate rooms, given four hours to create. And one of the assignments was to create the blue room piece. And if we go to the next slide. The other assignment was to create an entire state dinner table setting. So this was a month before the first Obama state dinner with India. And I think they wanted to see what the floral candidates would create. So my concept was based on the inspiration of the Indian peacock and the colors, the, the elements, the kinds of flowers, um, all related to that. So you can see that green is a very bold shade of green, uh, apple green. The flowers were purple and fuchsia. Um, and I wanted it to be very classical, um, but tell a story and also have a, a modern touch. If we go to the next slide. After the four hours, um, I remember, I'll never forget, being in the map room again and the door slowly opening and in came the first lady with um, her staff and there were lots of people and the photographer and the social office. And we had this lovely conversation about flowers, about decor, about entertaining and what she envisioned as what, what, her, what her goals would be and how she wanted people to feel. She wanted them to feel warm and welcomed. Um, so, so we talked about the flowers. There was also an Oval Office piece. And for that arrangement, I made something that was very autumnal, a little more masculine. And the color scheme was orange, um, umber, those colors. And I knew that the president was a big sports fan. And I said, well, you know, if I included blue in this bouquet, it could be a Chicago Bears theme. And she said that she, that he would like that. Um, so that was the interview process. We go to the next slide. And then uh, this launched that whole month long um, incredible experience of putting together the state dinner. So you see the, the competition table and how it translated into the tent. And um, it's also fun to note that the use of vintage White House items like the, the Nixon era chandeliers, um, the china was the Bush china that was used in the tent. Again, it was for 400 people. Um, and then in the background, you can see the magnolia topiaries um, that were about 16 feet off the ground, all made with sustainably harvested magnolia. So there were all of these themes that told a story and the Indian peacock was really the starting point. Uh, the next slide, please. Um, and then another fun state dinner, and this I think was the second one for Mexico, was uh, another opportunity to tell a story with the decorations, with the elements. Those are the, the incredible verme candelabra for, for the main table. The, the baskets were handmade in Mexico and gilded. So similar to the, um, the Tiffany bamboo centerpieces, but um, again, everything was designed to tell a story, the linens, and the colors of the flowers reference the Mayan sun and sea gods. If we go to the next slide, you can see the whole room and the strolling um, quintet before the dinner, but this was a very fresh, um, vibrant color scheme. The next slide I think shows, oh, um, one of the, the most memorable elements that I ever used in, in my designs, the prickly pear cactus. Um, which uh, had a lot of prickly pricks on them that made, um, made a few of the, the volunteers, a few of the staff see the, the White House medics. So here they are as arrangements. They're indigenous to Mexico, so that was the whole concept. Um, but uh, you know, it was really a lesson learned that um, because no one wanted to take them down afterwards. And um, that was definitely a one-time design. The next slide, please. So the White House Christmas was my favorite time of year 
the holiday season in general, it was year round at the White House because of the scope and um, it just the dimension of it. If you go to the next slide, it started in the flower shop with um, coming up with ideas and brainstorming. 24-7 um, was how we worked there and the, the Christmas ideas really started in January throughout the following year. So you can see how it starts with a color palette and with themes room by room. There's the overarching theme that is selected. The first lady selects it, I would say in the spring and, um, and then it's not revealed until the decorations are revealed. But at that point we would create these examples. It was always easier as a designer to show people who maybe weren't designers how something would look in real life. The next slide, please. One of my favorite projects, and um, I think one of my favorite volunteers is actually on the webinar tonight, was responsible for helping to make these designs. These column covers that are plywood, uh, plywood base, 14 feet tall, um, about five feet wide, eight inches or so deep that um, the carpenters are putting up. I remember this day we were filming for HGTV and there were some cutouts around the bottom to go around, I don't know, fixtures or moldings and um, the carpenters cut the wrong end. So this had to be redone. And when I show you a close up, you'll see how painstakingly um, tedious work that um, really detailed work it is. If we can go to the next slide. Um, well, this is the, the finished design and with Nancy Reagan, but they're made out of berries, out of pine, pine cone scales and folded leaves. And I think the next one Allison is the detail piece. So 60,000 berries, um, you know, tens of thousands of pine cone scales and these folded leaves. So it took a team of volunteers and then a few very special volunteers to measure the design, this illusion cube motif that was also referenced in the Red Room. There's a very famous table that's a marble top that has this very same pattern. So, you know, a subtle way linking um, these designs together. So next one, please. Some more favorite projects. These are the Red Room vases. And I think a lot of you know that one of the White House traditions at Christmas time is to have this cranberry vase in the Red Room, a cranberry topiary. And during my tenure, it was fun to switch it up every year and create something that had a cranberry element that maybe was a little different, something that people could wonder about and look forward to seeing. So these are two examples of sugar flower vases made out of sugar paste. Um, so everything you look at there, you see on the left, the flowers, each petal, each berry. Um, on the right, the whole vase is made out of sugar flowers. And then I would put real flowers in the top. Um, so I, I always thought that was one of my favorite projects. Next slide, please. Um, and here's the red room in, with another version. Um, this time the cranberry element is in the windows with the wreaths. So um, I think different types of striped berries um, that are red on red theme, very saturated color. If you've ever been to this room, um, you know what a, a magical place it is and why it is the favorite room of, of several first ladies. During the holidays, the, the fires are lit and um, it has a very cozy atmosphere. Next slide. The green room um, often had an environmental theme. So these are actually trees made out of recycled aluminum cans that were cut. We cut the ends off, fringed them and created these very classical topiaries. And it's amazing that the aluminum can is a wonderful crafting project. Um, little sharp edges, you have to watch out for that. But um, when you're using something that is not organic, I, I always like to add the organic touch. So these are the thin boxwood garlands and the finials. So having that balance of the fresh 
um, with the inorganic, that the silver match the, the silver of the silver set that is often displayed in this room and was a nice counterpoint to this green damask um, wall coloring. Next slide. So the blue room was always the centerpiece of, of the whole holiday display with the biggest tree, um, you know, it was almost 19, 20 feet tall. It took a whole team of volunteers to decorate it. Um, thousands of ornaments, thousands of lights, um, but it was always just spectacular. It often had its own theme. Um, one year I remember when HGTV was filming, filming that um, they were delayed four or five hours getting to us. And it was because the, the Blue Room tree was so large, oversized, so fluffy at the bottom that it couldn't come through the North Portico door. So they actually had to take off the door, take off the doors to the Blue Room and kind of ram the tree in there. It took, I think it took about 20 guys, but eventually, um, eventually they put the tree up and, and this is the result. The next slide, please. So you saw some other versions of Bow and Sunny. This is called Classic Bow. The first year that we created um, the replica of the, the favorite, you know, just the, the wonderful Obama dog Bow out of 40,000 pipe cleaners. So we had volunteers over several months create little looped um, just garlands that we applied Bo, who's featured here in front, you can see him, um, he came into the flower shop, we, we measured his white markings, and then the under the undercarriage, the under part of it is a chicken wire frame. So Mrs. Obama wanted a place for the children to feel like it was part of their holiday experience. And each year after that, um, we created another version of Bo. So if you, you go to the next one, I think this shows the robotic dogs when they were actually moving. So these were, um, we, we, we had some wonderful White House fellows, um, a technology group on, on staff, two teams who competed against each other. There was the Sunny team and the Bow team, and they um, had these computer parts that they fitted inside the net to make the head swivel. And Sunny actually had motion sensor eyes. So when you walk by, she, uh, her eyes would track you. Um, but it was a lot of fun. This was something that we shared and broadcast in schools nationwide um, to, to kind of challenge kids um, to what they could do with, with technology. And I think the parts were like $25 to, to do this. So each year we kind of upped the ante um, you know, with the First Lady's challenge um, to, to make it a, a special experience. We can go to the next slide. So I wanted to kind of circle back then and show you about, you know, we talked about floral diplomacy on a personal level at the White House and, um, and then the platform that's even broader than that. So a few years ago, I had the opportunity to do an installation in Ghent, Belgium for Floralian, which is a major flower show. Um, I think it's been going on for about 250 years. And they actually invited me to do a display that would represent floral diplomacy. So the idea was to create a capital dome. And um, it's hard to tell scale, but this was 16 feet tall, made out of curly willow. And then eventually it was covered in about 700 potted blue um, hyacinth. So the scent was incredible. And in the center was a floral display with stripes uh, and homage uh, to the flag, and then this dove of peace. So the, the whole theme was diplomacy, peace, um, international relations. If we go to the next slide. Um, you can see the whole display. So this was in a hall that um, commemorated World War I, and there was a, a particularly moving place that represented Flanders Field. So with the red poppies where, you know, the soldiers died. And at the end of it, after walking through this kind of very somber, um, somber somberly lit place, you came to the, the flower dome. 
um, which was kind of a sign of, of hope. So it was a fantastic project. I think the next slide shows the awards dinner where um, there were ambassadors and I was surprised. I didn't know this was happening, but they gave me the flower ambassador award and asked me to do an impromptu speech. Um, the chairman of the European Council wrote a haiku and it went something like the orchard in bloom reborn each year again, we salute its blossoms. So I, I have this at, at home now, but an incredible event where the idea of floral diplomacy, I think really took root with all these floras from the different countries. And it was during a time where, um, you know, it was a little tense. There had been a bombing at the Brussels airport. Many of the floras decided not to travel. And uh, I felt it was important to be there. And, um, and so that kind of started my thinking about the book Floral Diplomacy. Next slide, please. And then Allison mentioned the TED Talk. So if anyone out there um, wants to increase their stress level or challenge themselves, um, agree to do a TED Talk two months before and have it all memorized. So my, my TED Talk I found out about in the summer, I think it was 2017. And um, you know, it was either September, October, I, I gave it. And they said, well, you can't use any notes. Um, which is harder than it thinks. I mean, even having a podium in front of you gives you a little bit of security, but, um, but it was a great experience. And um, I was on a panel with um, a lot of incredible people, including Bob Woodward, um, who gave a great talk. The, the next slide, please. Um, and then the stamp project, um, also just one of my favorite projects, about five years in the works. Um, this started in Old Town, Alexandria, where I live. Um, the art director from the United States Postal Service walked by my house, saw a wreath, and asked if I would be interested in creating or um, creating prototypes or potentially creating stamps um, for Christmas, for the holidays. And so this launched the process of design and um, what I learned from that. And then eventually there were 20 art directors involved in determining what the final designs would look like is that a wreath on the door looks very different in scale as a postage uh, stamp. So we set, settled on these very classical designs on red and white doors. Um, but almost designs that you could make yourself at, at home. So out of leaves, out of berries, pine cones, things that you can find um, you know, in the yard, in the garden. And um, on the right is when the stamps were unveiled um, up in Freeport, uh, Maine at um, the LL Bean headquarters. The postmaster general made some remarks talked about how she learned or she was a postal carrier and would often go by and, um, you know, note what was on the doors and admire all the wreaths. And, and it just reminded me of how my own postal carrier used to complain uh, about my wreaths, especially the fruit wreaths that um, they would get a little overly ripe at, at times. But um, so a, a very special event. Next slide, please. That launched into a, a whole kind of deep dive into wreath design, uh, expanding the use of materials. So again, the potatoes, the berries, um, using motifs like the reindeer on the right covered in pine cone scales. And we can keep moving, Allison. A few designs to show you. The one on the left is made out of 400 dried eggplant. Um, it's about four feet tall. The, the apples and helleboras, all different shapes. Um, I usually start with a base layer of greenery or ribbon, moss, something to give a form, and then the materials can float over the top. The next slide, I think, shows some more colorful designs of fruits and flowers. Um, if you have a fresh element like orchids, they, you can use a little water tube to, to tuck inside. But all of the fruit, all of the materials are wired on so that they're solid. Um, the one on the right has plums and pears. 
Uh, next slide, please. Um, and, you know, I, I love using just the things I can find in, in the garden, the, the foliage that's growing in the pots, um, the fingerling potatoes on the right um, go well with the, with the pears. So when I go to the grocery store, I'm often in the produce aisle, mixing and matching and kind of designing in my head what the next wreath will be. Um, the next slide, please. So these led to the books, the wreaths and bouquets. And if we um, go to the next one, we can start looking at the flowers. I mean, because that's really uh, where I started, you know, when I fell in love with the French design. So the theme is uh, with these bouquets, Marie Antoinette, um, the, the really lavish bouquets in the garden style, um, using seasonal things, um, you know, the colors now of spring. Uh, it's, it's probably my favorite season here in Virginia um, with all the flowering branches. The, the next slide. You'll see the organic containers in, in a lot of my displays, um, but I also like to use classical things. So even the, the champagne buckets or, or wine coolers are, are wonderful for the larger scale designs. This is um, design is inspired by Monet, um, watercolor paintings, the flowers that just kind of, or the colors that just flow from one, one to the other. Next slide. Um, the Provencal theme on the left of sunflowers with moss and wheat um, and lavender. So I always start with a theme and then I think about the container, the container, provides like this integrated approach to design. So the pumpkin spice latte wreath on the right has little baby pumpkins and cinnamon, so more an autumnal theme. But by starting with a theme and thinking about, well, what will carry that out? It will really guide you um, to all, all of the right elements. The next slide, please. This was a Downton Abbey theme. So right now I find that the vintage colors you know, the, the, uh, these kind of faded lavenders and pinks and beige. Um, it's very fashionable, I think very intriguing. So many of the new flowers now, especially the carnations are coming in these antique colors. So it's a vase of fruit and flowers and, and, um, and berries with, with the hydrangea. So here's where I use a mix of fresh and dried materials the hydrangea can dry in place. So if you make something like this and have dried flowers as a base, you can actually switch out some of the fresh materials and keep it going for, for much longer. Let's go to the next one. Um, this is the cherry pie. Um, again, just trying to think of something using the bounty of the season. I go to the flower markets and to the grocery store. The, the crust is made out of a big wide yarn that's wrapped with craft paper and then just woven onto a simple bucket. Um, and so, you know, uh, and then filled with uh, the seasonal zinnias and, and roses and things. So, so that I really just encourage you to, um, to use your imagination. There are really, it's so, there, there are so many endless possibilities. The next one, if we could. Um, this was uh, a theme, um, I think this was for um, what I was speculating that the royal wedding would look like. So when Prince Harry married, um, uh, yeah, when, when he got married, yes, I, I thought, well, he's going out to, you know, doing these sentimental flowers that reference Princess Diana and, um, you know, just a mix of um, one and another to, to create this delicate spring look. And if, if you look at the pictures of the wedding, um, you know, we never actually did see, I think, pictures of the reception, but the actual bridal bouquet was very delicate and, and had that feeling. And I know that there were some um, special flowers from, from Princess Diana. The next slide, please. So one of the most recent projects I did right before the pandemic was to go on location in Paris, back to Paris to visit all of my flower friends who I had studied with beginning um, almost 20 years ago. And so it was so much fun to reconnect with them. Let's go to the next slide. 
and um, and just hear about their their current vision. And you know, it's really a testament to their talents about how they are still at the top of their game. So people like Stefan Chappelle and Eric Chauvin, Catherine Mueller, um, Clarice Barad, and if anyone wants to know more about any of these um, fabulous designers, they all give lessons, they all teach. Um, I highly recommend it. But this was the, the special setting at the Baccarat Museum that my friend who's the florist at the Ritz Hotel created, Ann Vitchen. She has a, a beautiful Instagram account. Um, and she didn't tell me she was doing this. We were coming to talk to her and to have a photo shoot, but at the Baccarat Museum in this incredible ballroom, if you can imagine Versailles, she created this table setting of all the best of the French art. So the French porcelain, the French linens, um, you see the French champagne and the croquembouche, and then the, the dome of garden roses. If we go to the next slide, you can see how it looks in the ballroom. So hundreds of fragrant garden roses. And I, I remember going through this unassuming little door to get to this room, seeing this display and just my jaw dropping. I'd never seen anything so beautiful. And at the end of the shoot, um, here we are toasting uh, French art de vivre and flower friends, um, flowers in the French style, the garden style. Um, truly a fabulous, um, memorable event. And I think there's one more slide taking us back to the White House. And so I just wanna close and um, read the last piece that, that I have in my floral diplomacy book that I think hopefully will sum it up. Floral diplomacy has a voice that resonates globally, evoking feelings and understanding that transcend time, place, and circumstances. Like the orchard in bloom referenced in the European Council's haiku, flower blossoms are fragile yet strong, reflecting the resiliency of the human spirit. Fleeting yet enduring, dependable, beautiful, eternal. So that's uh, my presentation. This is 4th of July at the White House. Um, it was 100 degrees, 100% humidity, but always an incredible event. So if anyone has questions, um, you know, I think we might have a few minutes for questions. We do have a few questions, Laura. Okay. Thank you. That was amazing. I feel like transported to the White House and to France. It was wonderful and so exquisite and just really amazing. And I know meeting with you, I've seen that little peak of your uh, kitchen space, but to see your home is so amazing. Um, so one of the first questions I had for you was, um, when you were speaking of your interview at the White House, you said there were lots of questions about managing people and thinking about all of the different people who work at the White House. Who were your collaborators? Because we know there are um, National Park Service engineers, um, East Wing staff. Were you working with State Department for protocol? Um, who all is involved in planning this and how hands on is the first lady for these types of events? Yeah, no, that's a great question. And the short answer is all of the above. Everyone you named was a collaborator. Um, I think at times it could even be the president. You know, there have been times when the president has opinions on flowers and decorations and entertaining. But for the most part, I feel so lucky in a way and, and blessed that I, I had a lot of, um, I, I think, authority to um, initiate design discussions where people could weigh in. And sometimes the discussions would be initiated in other places, whether it was the East Wing or with the First Lady. But it was a real collaboration. And I always viewed my job as collaborating with everyone with the goal of creating the most spectacular, successful event that represented the First Lady's vision and represented our country and our style. And, and so I think from that starting point, um, you know, that, that always kind of, um, I, I don't know, was a good guiding, a good guidepost. 
um, and and just I don't know an amazing experience to be able to have all the talented people around me. I mentioned the volunteers, um, probably hundreds of volunteers who worked with me over the years, and it was really my goal to open up the White House, open up the flower shop, and let people work with me. And and I'm still in touch with so many of them. And we, we reminisce and, and talk about some of our favorite projects. Um, one of the other questions people had, in particular in the White House, how did you source the flowers? Were they from the garden? Were they uh, shipped in from different places? And was it all fresh flowers or was some of it synthetic? So they were always fresh flowers and the flowers came from everywhere. I think um, there was a, a movement that started during my tenure to start focusing on locally grown and American grown flowers. So that became something to look at. And, and I always loved being able to rely on the local farms and the, you know, the beautiful flowers that are available in the DC area when things are in season. There would be special things that we would need, whether they were orchids or in the case of the prickly pear cactus, those were sourced um, from Cactus Jack. I think he was in Nevada. So uh, working at the White House, we had access to, to get everything we need needed. Um, someone had a more specific question about um, how does the flower and plant meaning feature into your work um, compared to maybe work that might happen at a floral shop? Um, if so, what do you consider the best references for that? Can you give some examples? I think you mentioned a few, um, but if you could go in a little more depth about the yeah. flowers and the meaning well, behind them. So, so that's really interesting because there, there is a long-standing tradition, and I think it dates back to Victorian or maybe even before that, Victorian times, of flowers having specific meanings. And what I would say my approach is, is much broader and, um, and more based on a theme or telling a story. So for example, um, when we hosted the, uh, the German chancellor, Angela Merkel, in the research, we found out that she has a PhD in quantum physics. And so that initiated this idea of creating molecular style designs or a theme that a science theme design. So, it, so instead of focusing or letting, I guess what I would say is that instead of letting the flower um, drive the meaning all the time, there, there's a much broader way to look at it based on what messages you're trying to communicate, what story you're trying to tell. Um, other parts of that design included all little yellow, delicate flowers. Yellow is her favorite color. She grew up in a small town in Eastern Germany. And so those flowers were specific there. But you can see how you can really get some depth and meaning when, when you approach flower design like that. Did the Secret Service have any role in like, um, screening the flowers. I know at Christmas when things are coming in, especially if you're working with some of the um, odd, odder objects that you shared, like um, non-plant material, were, were they searching those or evaluating them in any way? So we, we had um, some preferred providers and vendors who were pre-screened and, you know, their delivery trucks and drivers all had clearances. So once they went through that, that clearing process, they didn't have to do that every day. Um, but, but you're right, anything that's sent to the White House um, typically goes through a, a screening process at an offsite facility. But for the ongoing daily things like, you know, flower deliveries, um, there, there's a plan for that. But you mentioned the Secret Service role. And, and what's interesting is that in a way, they're the de facto tour guides when, of the White House tours. I think I read something recently that the tours are starting back up. But when people would come on tour, um, they might comment on the flowers. And um, I heard of at least a couple occasions 
where the secret service would, would tease the, the visitors and tell them that there were cameras hidden in the flowers. Um, so I don't know that that was, was the case. I, I think they were teasing, and, but they and definitely another, played a role. <laughs> another question in the um, Q&A is, um, was part of your job to choose the, it looked like you had really great mood boards, was part of your job to choose the tablecloth, choose the china, or was that kind of a collaborative effort? So that was always, um, I, I think, one of my favorite aspects of, of, the, of the job. And you can see by like the, the china collections I, I have at home, mixing and matching and matching flowers and linens, um, you know, was just one of my favorite things. So yes, it would start in the flower shop, typically creating different options, different moods, different storylines um, with the flowers, the china, the linens, the crystal, uh, the candlesticks, um, usually from the White House collection, although we might um, switch it up at, at different times depending on the event. But, um, but yes, that was all part of the job. There's a few more questions and um, some shout outs from previous volunteers at the White House and people who have worked with you in the chat. So very excited to say hello, but also people who are curious as to how they can volunteer at the White House and if you have any recommendations. Yeah, so it changes with each administration. And I think over the last few years, it's gotten more formalized where starting in the spring, so I would actually say we're coming up on, on the time, probably around April, that if you're a, a holiday interested in volunteering for the holidays, you should go online, whitehouse.gov, I think slash holidays, and put your hat in the ring and make an application. Um, they'll wanna know what kind of design experience you have, what your, what your story is, um, you know, maybe you're doing it together with a friend or a mother daughter or um, a couple. But um, if you have a good story, if you have great experience, um, and then just keep following up, uh, put the application in. Um, usually, the volunteers I think are selected in the fall. But the one thing I would also point out to people is that everyone clamors to decorate the White House and with the, the um, decorations going up. The decorations also have to come down and that's a big job. And that's not as competitive, but you still get a chance to see everything decorated. So you show up on the day that everything comes down, usually right after the, the Christmas holiday and um, you take a tour, um, I think they serve you breakfast and then you start packing everything away um, and organizing it. So that's something to keep in mind if you find it hard to, to get into the, the actual decorating of the White House. So Laura, we've kept you for a long time and we have a ton of questions that we won't be able to get to today, but I wanted to ask one or two more. Um, a lot of times when you go to a wedding at the end of the night, there are these wonderful floral pieces and people are clamoring to take one home. Is that something that happens at a state dinner? What happens with these flowers once they're used? Wow. They're I mean, just, just the thought of that um, is so funny. It kind of makes me laugh because, you know, there have been times, I guess, when state dinner guests or White House guests have actually taken little souvenirs like the Eagle place cards and they actually had to make duplicates um, or, um, and it might, I don't know if it's Oprah or, or someone even talked about the White House towel that is in the, uh, the laboratory that that's also a favorite souvenir. But in terms of flowers, no, the flowers stay on site there, especially um, yes, especially if they're in the Verme bamboo or part of the White House collection and then repurposed again and again after that. So you saw the cooler after an event, the flowers come back to the cooler and then um, go to other places. But, um, but that is a funny image of people <laughs> carting flowers away. Uh, I don't think they would get very far. Yeah, yeah. So, um, 
I wondered if you have any tips for people who are interested in getting started and creating their own floral designs at home. Obviously, your books are a great resource and people should look out for those. Are there any like tips you have for people who are starting to create their own floral arrangements? So, so my biggest advice is just to jump in and find, find a passion, find a style, find someone whose style that you admire and like. And um, most designers are teaching now, or you can find schools to go to. I think that's a, a great way to learn some basic skills. There's so much online now, right, where you can practice. And, and that's a key element, too, that my kitchen became like my practice, um, you know, the practice place. And like with any kind of expertise, whether um, it's cooking or art, I think you have to put the hours in. But um, and then to develop your own style. Um, and the way you do that is just to look at nature, study um, beyond flowers, study other forms of art, um, study how to put colors together. I have a lot of art books and, um, and finding like the place, the, the actual specific source of inspiration, I think can, can carry you to the next level. Um, and then the final thing is when it comes time, go ahead and put your hat in the ring. You know, I often think back and wonder if my husband had not pushed me to enter the competition, if I would have done that. And um, so you need to have people around you who are kind of pushing you on and cheering you on and supporting you. I think that's important. So last but not least, I want to know more about your house. Is there a place where we can find more images of your house in Architectural Digest or in your oh, book? No. There's yeah, very... just so many inspiring elements from the art to um, the furniture to the flowers. Well, you're, you're very sweet. And it, I mean, it is a period house, so it's not really on trend with minimalist style. But um, my grandparents were antique dealers. My husband's been a collector. Um, you know, I love paintings and textiles and color. So it's been over many years that, that we've kind of created um, the, this vision. Um, but the next book that I've just started to work on will be Interiors and Flowers. So I hope to kind of really explore that connection between interior design and flowers. Um, it, it, it might be some of my house, but I, I think I want to go broader too. And um, so, yes, I'm just starting to work on that and hopefully we'll be out with within a year or so. Well, I think you might have missed a lot of the oohs and ahs. And I had a lot of gasps when I was looking at it, that my, my Zoom was saying, you're muted when I was like, ooh. So um, people have really enjoyed um, this this evening and I really appreciate you joining us this evening and sharing and thank you all for dealing with the AV issues. I think it went pretty smoothly once we figured it out, yeah. even after all of our practicing. So um, hopefully we can have you back again and we can chat about Christmas, florals, or so fun. other details. This has been really wonderful. But in the meantime, where can people find you? So um, I'm on social media. Laura Dowling, the florist, is on Instagram, and um, I'm on Facebook. Um, so yeah, that, that's a great way to connect. And for anyone whose questions weren't answered, please feel free to message me, and, and I'll follow up. Um, but it's just a pleasure to be here. Thank you, Allison. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Um, and especially, I, I can just picture all the, the volunteers Really one of my favorite memories is the opportunity to work with um, such great people. So, um, so, so fun to be here. Well, thank you so much, Laura. And again, I was a little frazzled at the beginning, but I wanna encourage people to head to the National First Ladies Library Facebook page, check out our Eventbrite. We've got a lot of amazing 
um, programs, activities, talks coming up. I think that Anne Han jewelry discussion is going to be really fun and amazing. And we'll delve into some great political jewelry and history. So if you enjoyed tonight's talk, I think you'll definitely enjoy that one. So thank you, Laura, for joining us. Thank you, everyone. Please reach out to Laura on social media and follow her so you can keep up with her floral adventures, check out her book, and again, check out the National First Ladies Library on Facebook to further connect with us. Thank you so much. Thank you. Have a great evening. You too.